Okay, everyone, we're going to go ahead and get started. So thank you for coming. There's a lot of really familiar faces in the room, and I appreciate that. Um, I'm hoping today's session is going to be collaborative and not me doing all the talking. So um, for those of you who are in the back of the room, if you want to come forward, that's great. I promise I won't like sit on your lap or anything, but um, if you're going to sit in the back, I will call on you. So just know that too. So the topic today is about collaboration, and this is about cross-industry collaboration. I don't know about you, but every time I come to a conference like this, apart from it being a bit of a sort of family reunion, it is also the time where we get together and we bitch and moan about the same problems over and over and over and over again. Is it resonating yet? You heard the same, any of the same war stories yet this morning as you've talked to people in the hallways? Yeah. So um, one of the interesting parts about working at Ohio State, sorry, the Ohio State University is that we put a fair amount of emphasis on how well we can collaborate with one another. Um, it's sort of part of the sort of the academic environment to collaborate. Um, in my old private sector life, collaboration was also known as meetings that don't provide a lot of value, right? There was this perception that that's not me. Hang on. Oh no. Some yeah, go for it. See, technical person, no technical skills. That's me. I didn't do that. Did I do that? No, it's the laptop doing it itself. So. Okay, I'm making the lap. Okay, awesome. So anyway, at Ohio State, um, we like to try and collaborate because there's a sense that um, the more minds you put against a problem, the more likelihood there is that you'll actually solve that problem. So when I was asked to talk here at the at the conference, I thought I would talk about collaboration as a way of solving some of the problems that we all commonly share. So what I'm hoping to get out of today, if I can make things work, is to find a reason not to have an excuse. So next year when you come back to this conference, you're talking about different problems and not the same old, same old. So what are we going to do? We'll talk a little bit about what I mean by what cross-industry collaboration really is. We're going to talk about what are the, some of the things they have in common and some of the things they don't. And the, the participation part of today is what are the problems that we all commonly have that we need a solution to, that we should work together on solving that problem. Okay? And I don't have all the ideas. I'm going to throw up some balloons and you can tell me if it's a good idea or not. So what does cross-industry collaboration look like? In the security world, um, probably the best example of cross-industry collaboration starts with the ISACs. Um, but what I find with the ISACs is um, they're good, but they tend to focus on one industry at a time. So in higher ed, we have REN ISAC, the Research and Ed Education ISAC. Medical Center has something. Who's in, who's in medical? Who's in hospitals? The what? You don't? OK. Um, retail, you got your own ISAC yet? Yeah, financial does, right? Yeah. What's the what's the what what's good about an ISAC? What do you get out of it? That's a question for you. That's not a rhetorical. What's good about an ISAC? Group therapy. Group therapy. It's always nice in community to get group therapy. What else do you get out of it? Right, you might get advanced knowledge of something that's happening somewhere else in your sector that you might know about. What do you not get out of an ISAC? Timely information, sometimes it's a bit slow. What do you mean by true collaboration? Not, not a whole bunch of coordination. Yeah, and I'll tell you as a CISO too, one of the challenges with ISAC is that you have to swear on your mother's grave when you join the ISAC that you won't tell anybody anything you learn in the ISAC and then it makes it really difficult to actually communicate that to the rest of your organization when there's something that they need to know without violating you know, the promise you gave that would result in you giving up your firstborn child. Yeah? 
But they have, a, they have a purpose. I would tell you I think they're reactive. I, cl I classify ISACs as reactive. Something's going on in the industry. Somebody knows about it already, and it's a way of you finding out. There's value in that, but it's not particularly proactive. What else are we seeing in the network, in, the, in our industry? We are seeing some of our vendors starting to get together now and solve individual issues that those vendors focus on as part of their product offering, yeah? So, um, I don't, um, so I Googled this, because I was actually sort of curious as to see what kinds of stuff might be going on, so I'm not prepared to tell you I'm an expert in this particular issue, but um, this particular program, you can see the people who are here, Cisco, FireEye, Tenable, Symantec, et cetera, um, and they were really looking at specific kinds of malware and trying to get in front of specific kinds of malware. So they, they, what you would imagine to be as um, competitors are getting together and trying to solve an individual technology issue. Is there anyone involved in this here in the room? No? But we are seeing these kinds of things today. I'm actually sort of impressed with this. It, it seems like some of our um, silos are coming down between our groups and we're starting to see some work here. I would also call this proactive other than in this particular case the malware still has to exist in the environment it's not like they've gone out and you know destroyed the groups that are creating the malware in the first place but it's more proactive than the ISACs are right they're really trying to shut down a problem um, I have a love-hate relationship with the federal government and the military but I put this up here as well when you look at the research that's going on in security um, there's a lot of work happening between our three-letter agencies, our academic institutions, um, and some private sector as well. Um, so the NIST you know, has the Cyber Center of Excellence. You can read the slide as well as I can. We're starting to see a lot more of this. The, the feds are waking up to the fact that they can't do this by themselves, and they're trying their best to reach out. Um, certainly if you're in academia, you're sort of in the crosshairs of, of seeing this stuff because... When you're in high air ed, you, you live and breathe working with federal grants and so forth. Um, but there are grants available to private sector companies as well that you might be thinking about taking advantage of if you haven't looked here already. But again, mostly reactive at this point. Some of it's proactive. And because we're in Columbus, I would be remiss if I didn't talk about the collaboratory. Who here works for a company that's part of the collaboratory? Yeah, absolutely. How's it working out for you guys? We're getting there. We're getting there. So they're focusing on cyber and data analytics, right? Um, this is a great cross-industry collaboration if you're already part of the club, right? Now, there's a cost to be part of the club, and these companies have paid it. And so I'm looking forward to seeing what comes out of it. I think it's fair to say it's still work in progress. Um, but it sort of sucks to be me. If I wanted to be part of this and I'm part of OSU, I can't be, right? So how do you take what these groups learn and share it more broadly? Or do we all, you know, anybody else want to have a collaboratory experience? You know, you can come and see me afterwards and maybe we'll set something up. I don't know. So there's all kinds of collaboration that's going on. What are these things not doing for us as an industry? What are they not providing us? They're not changing the overall landscape. Right, right. So what I thought I'd want to talk to you about today are what are the problems that we collectively share and is collaboration a way for us to solve the problems that we have. So I'm going to go through a list of problems that I thought up in about 30 seconds. I'm interested to know if you have other problems that you would put on the board and we can have a chat about them. So these are the things that I see as a CISO and in talking to you and in talking to people are some of our biggies. We still don't have enough talent. Is there anyone who's fully staffed with a fully diverse organisation got all the resources you want, know where to get them when someone leaves. Has anyone solved for this yet? Okay, that's what I thought. Um, second, 
I put security assessment results. As an industry, and I I'm, know I'm, I'm being followed by a, a third party assessment uh, presentation, we have an obligation to understand what our third party security profiles are. But it means that every single one of us is going out and doing security assessments of every single company. They've got to be, I'm tired of it, I know they've got to be tired of it, right? Big problem, frankly a big waste of money, collectively. Getting the board to buy in to cyber, I know there's another talk, there was a talk, there will be a talk about this at the, at the session, is a problem we all have, even if you don't have a board. Even if you're a part of a little company that's just got a CEO and a dog, you've still got a board buy-in problem. You know, the dog just don't get it, so we've got to work on that. And then lastly, building trust in contracts. Building trust in our contracts is a problem that we've got, I think. So what can we do about it? This is where I throw out some ideas you may and may not agree with, and in some cases I don't throw out any ideas. Talent acquisition. I think groups like this, ISSA, SANS, others, we're starting to scratch at this, but we are all scratching different itches. Or, to mangle the analogy even further, we're scratching a different part of the same itch. I think we've got an opportunity to collaborate as an industry and solve for this. Um, let me give you an example. This morning, because I guess I can't get enough of hearing my own voice, I was part of a panel and we were talking about diversity in STEM to a bunch of HR recruiters. The HR recruiters don't know what security is. They don't know what it means. They don't know how to hire for it. They don't know where to go to find recruits. To, to look for, they don't know how to bridge people who aren't security people into security, they don't know. We should be telling them as a collective voice what they should be doing because they don't know. They should, And they've got hundreds of tech jobs that they have to hire for and probably hundreds more non-tech jobs as well. So what are we doing, what are you doing in your company, your industry, to help the people who actually go out and do the recruiting for us to do a good job. We have an opportunity, I think. Um, internships are a big part of building our pipeline. We don't, we, it's not that we have all these people at the beginning of their career and then they get to middle management and they leave. We don't even have the pipeline built up at the moment, right? What can we do for internships? There's a whole, again, a whole bunch of companies that are out there that are, that are working for internships. SANS is there, again, um, ISC Squared, some of the government agencies and so forth. But if you're a little company and you're trying to build up a security team or you're, you know, one dude and a dog, where can you go? Because most of those internships sort of assume that you've got a big diverse organisation and that you've got a career path for those interns when they come in. How can we collaborate together to say, you know what, I'm going to take this one intern, bring them into my group, and when they're done, I'm going to hand them over to another employer who's maybe does the same stuff but in a different industry, or does the same stuff but maybe the next level up. Okay? I think we've got an opportunity to talk amongst ourselves and, and be more strategic about how we can work on this together. Uh, if you read materials about public boards, but this also applies to private boards, they are looking for people with cybersecurity experience to serve on those boards. And in fact, the SEC, I think the SEC has proposed um, public company, publicly traded company rules. They've proposed that those boards include somebody who has cybersecurity experience on it. What are we doing as an industry? to identify security professionals who have the competency to serve on a public board? And how do we get those names in front of the people who are recruiting for boards? Because I don't know about you, but I sit in front of the board and I've got some very intelligent, technology savvy people on my board. And it's like an amoeba talking to a rock. And I'm, I'm, I'm not proposing to tell you whether I'm the amoeba or the rock, right? But there is definitely a disconnect 
trying to talk about the tactical issues of rolling out a security program with a board member. So we need to fund and funnel people who can, who can sit on boards and understand it and then translate that to the other board members. We've got an issue there. Yeah. Is this a problem for you guys or is this just my particular PTA? It's real? Yeah. So we're starting to see vendors who for a price will pay, will, will allow you to look at their assessments of particularly other cloud vendors and stuff like that. Have you guys seen these kind of vendors knocking on your door yet? A little bit? Yeah. Um, and certainly, if you're, if you're assessing a large company, they'll have an SSA 16 or something like that that they'll probably share with you and you can take a look at that. I don't know about, are there any external auditors in the room? Anyone who audits companies for a living? Okay, good. So here's what I would tell you about that. When you get your security people together and, they, and, you, and you're being audited, what do the security people think about the competency of the external auditors? We're amongst friends, you can say it. Inexperienced, right? Right out of school. Do they understand the context of the company they're auditing? Probably not. So are you going to rely on the SSA 16 as a good, solid security assessment of a vendor? Is that the only thing you're going to go, yep, got myself an SSA 16, I only got one comment on it, they must be great. So, please, yep. Yep. Right. Absolutely. So let me ask you this. Is an SSA 16 a security assessment? A SOC 2 might be. Is it a risk assessment? Control assessment. What kind of control assessment? As determined by that management. So you're going to take this company and you're going to use them to provide a medical app to you. Or some, or some mechanical thing in your operations department. Is that SSA 16 going to be tuned to the business purpose that you're going to be using that vendor for? What's the likelihood of that? No. So what has to happen? You have to go out and do your own assessment all over again, right? How many people have a standard assessment for their vendors? Yeah, it saves time. Awesome. But don't you think as an industry, we could go, look, here's a baseline set of questions we're all going to ask. What's the first question everyone asks? Do you have an SSA 16? <laughs> Do you think companies could just like publish that on a website somewhere? Do you have an SSA? Don't make me ask. What's the second question? Do you have a security policy? Right. So there's all these questions that as good security professionals we're going to go ask and we're going to ask every single vendor the same damn question 500 times and we never see how they answered it the, four, the first 450 times. So we don't know if the answer we're getting is the same answer that Joe gets down the street or not. There's no transparency in that and it's costing our firms and it's costing them hundreds of thousands of dollars. Can't we fix this? As an industry, isn't there a solution to this? What's the barrier? Wait till the next session. <laughs> Hang out till the next session. Which brings me to the last one. Contract trust. There's actually two, two pieces to this. If I engage in a contract with a vendor and I find a problem with the vendor and I know that my Big Ten school down the street uses the same vendor, I'd really like to be able to tell them. Wouldn't you want to know? But I can't. It's a liability thing. I have a problem with lawyers. I, I, for those of you who've seen me speak in the past, except Holly, I like Holly, but in general I don't like lawyers. 
Um, why? Well, because they think like lawyers. They don't think like risk managers. And they don't think like security people. And that's a problem when you're in risk and security trying to deal with your legal contract lawyers who are writing contracts to limit liability. That's their primary purpose, really, is to limit liability. So nothing gets written into the contract that says, look, we're really a partner with our vendor. And if they have a risk or an issue or a vulnerability, collectively it's in our best interest to work together to fix that. But instead they write a contract that says, if the vendor has a problem with a contract, with a vulnerability, they better damn well fix it before we find out about it or we're going to sue them for breach of contract. Worst case. I'm really good at awfulizing, if you haven't worked that out yet. So I think we have an opportunity, again, as an industry to educate our legal partners about how to interpret contracts so that we can engage in partnerships with our vendors rather than contracts that already assume that they're out to get us and they're out to take their piece of our pie. And we have to think about that. We also have to get away in our contracts from putting in non-disclosure agreements for things that impact more than just us. It's a delicate thing. I, I, I know that it sort of makes people a little uncomfortable not having an NDA. But as an industry, who are the people that know the vulnerabilities are existing in a company? The bad people. I'm trying to use gender non-specific language and sometimes it doesn't apply. The, the bad guys know where all the vulnerabilities are. Who doesn't know where the vulnerabilities are? Us. What's wrong with this picture? Right? So we've got to think about these industry problems and how we can start to solve them. So, those were my suggestions. Now I'd like to hear from you about what you think about those. Are they solvable? Has anyone seen any of those four? Let me go back. Has anyone solved for any of these? Or don't think any of these are worthy? Go ahead. Yep. Right. Right. Yep. I'll repeat. So I'm hearing two things, just to repeat for the people who may not have heard that. One is, as an industry, we shouldn't expect people to be 100% ready to go when they walk in the door. We should be setting expectations that there's going to be a ramp period. And two, we should be looking at sympathetic industries or job types that could bridge into security that aren't necessarily security people and writing our job descriptions and, and job offers accordingly. Am I hearing that right? Develop your own talent. Who's got time to develop their own talent? Show hands. Yeah, you've got to make it. Yeah. I, I don't I'm not disagreeing at all. I, I think you're right. 
But how do we translate that into something that's going to be useful for our recruiting partners or our educators in colleges, if that's where you're going to get your candidates from? How do we, how do we, what do we need to change ourselves to make that happen? One thing we could do as a professional is get with the educators, with the programs, and tell them what we need. Yeah. Make them aware of what we need in our of what we need in our business and say, can you tailor your program to teach some of this stuff? Because they might you know, really teach in a book, and the book is, is great and it's got good information in it, but it doesn't necessarily meet the current needs of the industry as a whole. So you gotta help guide those programs by, by getting with them. Sure. So is anyone here engaging with academic institutions to talk about curriculum? Yeah? Wow. Lots. You want to talk about that? Sure. So the same kind of problem we're trying to solve in Dayton with Sinclair Community College. And they said the problem they're having is if we move the curriculum, it messes up their accreditation. Right? Accreditation is a big deal for schools. So I said, well, technology is moving fast, security is moving fast, the curriculum is going to seek foundation in theory. Can we open up a workforce development center that is moving along with the core curriculum modules? So we formed a workforce development at Sinclair Community College, and we write courses that are more relevant, that resonate well with what's going on today. Mm -hmm. That's an example of how we're trying to do this kind of stuff in our community. But it's very, you know, it's it's not at a scale where we can Right. Yeah, the scaling issue is probably the biggest challenge in that area, right? How many of you knew about a program like this before you sat in the room and we were discussing it right now? Just a couple, right? So one of the collaboration opportunities we have as a security industry is finding ways to share when we're doing this kind of stuff, right? How is it? ISSA, I think, as an organization could be really well placed actually to be a, a gathering place of, hey, we're trying this. We don't know if it'll work or not, but we're trying it. We haven't got that yet. We've been competing with one another for so long that we're not yet trusting each other to be able to share that stuff, even if it hasn't worked yet. Right? Yeah, go ahead, Trey. Right. What's the half life of technology skills coming out of a college degree, right? Sorry, hold that thought. Go ahead. Yep. Absolutely. But I'm sympathetic to the HR teams. They need they need requirements that they can scale for and troll through in a mechanized way, right? They don't. I don't know about you, but I don't have a recruiter who's sitting there that's just you know going through hundred resumes at a time. They don't. I'm, I know at Chase that like one recruiter had 
2,500 positions or something they had to recruit for. They don't have time to go through that kind of stuff. So they're going to us and saying, how many years experience do you need? What kind of technologies are you looking for? What's your education requirement? So they can plug it into an app, God help us, and have the app spit out the 15. Right? So we've got to help them think about what are those requirements that allows them to do their job and scale, but still pulls the right kind of candidates through. And it's a, it's a tough balance to get at. IT. Look for people that have investigative techniques, auditors, law enforcement, people of that nature that have the, the investigative mind that you need to have to find and resolve the issues in that environment. Sure. So what else is missing from up here? These were just my top four. I think, you know, when I talk to security people at conferences, these things come up all the time. But maybe it's just me. I don't know. Do you have others? that you think are systemic security issues? Digital awareness? User, User awareness. How do you... User awareness. So user awareness of how to be secure or user awareness of the general security environment? So, so I, don't, I don't disagree, it's a problem, I, but I'm not sure that you're characterizing it the right way, so I'm going to challenge you a little bit, and you guys can tell me if I'm full of it or not. I don't think it's that they don't know, I think it's that they don't care. They don't care. They've got, I don't know, when you guys were getting up, getting ready to come here this morning, and you were going for a run or having a shower or whatever, were you worried that somebody could be hacking into your bank account at any given time? Would you care about this if you weren't in the industry? Yeah, so when I talk to the, high, the college students, like I'm like, hey, I'm Helen, I'm your friendly neighborhood CISO, and I'm here to tell you about all the scary things that could be happening to your student records. They're like, we don't care. We don't care. We put it all on Facebook, we put it all on Snapchat. If I lose my, if someone steals my credit card, I get a new one. Rock on, banks, good job. They don't care. Yeah. Yes, there's going to be some that don't care. Never going to hear stuff. Okay, so I've got a team of, uh, hypothetical, this isn't my own team. I have, a, I have a team of people who are computer science people, largely, um, literate in technology, and I'm asking them to become psychologists and social engineers. Do you think, as an industry, we have an opportunity to reach out to psychologists and social engineers who are not technologists and learn from them? Are we? Is there anyone here who's not a technologist who's talking about social engineering at this conference? You see the point? We're trying, we're trying to solve these common problems ourselves. Not even ourselves as an industry, but ourselves as an individual company or an individual unit in an individual company. And some of these things are big, gnarly, cultural things that we're trying to adjust. We can't do that on our own. So you're right. I will put that up there as number five, but probably actually number one on the list. We're, not, we're, we're doing an awful job of it as a security profession. I would put it out there. You can kill me later. Yeah, go ahead. things, we use many different types of frameworks and to do many different things. I, you know, when I first moved here, English language is, is, is unique in a sense. Well, it's not unique, but one word can mean many things. See, can mean body, water, or vision. Security had that same issue. 
And so we create mappings and harmonization. There's no, there's a standard out there, but nobody adopts it and says this is it. Yeah. That creates a huge issue, especially when we do assessments. You, you know, that's that's one of the biggest inefficiencies that I've seen. Common language. Common language. Now, if you could all just speak with an Australian accent, life would be much easier. No, I'm <laughs> well, that's bought in by at least your legal team, the government, right. everybody, right? The whole community, not just, well, our industry has this one. Right. Absolutely. How do we sell for it? It's hard enough to do that even just to get them on company. That's like the company I work for now, it's a large risk management team, and we're fighting the battle of how do we speak the same language when we write assessments? This really needs to be with our company. Right. Right. You can't just say there's one framework that everybody can be following. If you know before, if you look at the rule, you actually have to write it in a specific language that someone said, here's the new language that everybody's going to use. Right. We can't even decide what to call ourselves as an industry. We cyber, cyber, information security, security, risk, information risk, IT security. What are we? Is it part of just we're a maturing industry that we haven't worked this out yet? IT is IT, right? Is security security and that, in co that covers all those other things? Maybe. Go ahead. But what I do know, what I do know though, is, is when I'm working, walking from my office to my car and it's three o'clock in the morning, I've probably got my mace in my pocket and I'm watching where I'm walking as I go. Right. So the issue isn't that we need people to understand how to use the tools. The issue is we need them to have an awareness of their environment and to, where appropriate, change their behavior as we need them to, right? But again, I go back to technology security teams haven't got the skills to, to make that happen. We're, we're, we're sourcing for the wrong kinds of skills. When you're, if you're looking for a technologist to run your security program, you're probably sourcing from the wrong place, right? I'm not saying you don't need a technologist. But I'm saying you, you need more than a technologist. You need someone who can understand how people think and how their behavior changes. You know, it's important to know that if you tell people most people change their password on a regular basis, then actually the psychology of it is most people will change their password on, on a basis. If you just complain that most people don't change their password, then people go, well, if everyone else is not changing their password, I won't. There's a psychology aspect to it, right? We've got to think about that. I know that we're almost out of time. Do I see a question back here? Yeah? Yeah. Yeah. Right? Yep. I have an, I'm going to give you an editorial on that one a little bit. Um, transferring risk is one of, is second to eliminating risk as a good risk strategy, right? If you can't eliminate the risk, give it to somebody else. We've allowed people to transfer their risk to the security teams for too long. It's not my problem. It's the security team's problem. It's not my problem. It's IT's problem. It's not my problem. They've got to wake up and realize it's a business problem that may or may not have a technology solution to it. And as a security team, we need technologists and psychologists and so forth to be able to help them manage their risk. So a cyber insurance policy may have a place to play there, except that it doesn't matter how much insurance you have, you assume reputational risk regardless of whether or not you get refunded for it. 
So they can't truly use a cyber policy to transfer their risk, I don't think. I don't know. Thoughts on that? Sure. I'm sure there's going to be another topic about cyber insurance somewhere in the schedule. Is, is anyone? I mean, it's hot. I, it's a hot topic. We, I don't think we've decided as an industry which way we want to go with it yet. Yeah. Sure. So, it's ten past. Are we done time-wise? I'm I'm awful with time. My team will tell you I'm awful, awful. Are we done? We're mostly done. Fifteen. We've got five minutes. One. Any final questions before I wrap? Go for it. Okay, Bill? So, two comments. Hmm. One is the challenge of Omega 3. In 2013, the National Academy of Sciences declared that cybersecurity, information security, whatever you want to call it, is a, is a career, not a profession. Right. We've done absolutely nothing as a group to, to change that. Mm -hmm. We have no common body of knowledge. We rely on certification. <coughs> we allow on certification bodies that make money off of us to drive this. Mm -hmm which is highlighted by a recent LinkedIn post that said, the career map for security is, and here's all the certification. <laughs> yeah, I saw that. From a certification a market, stuff. not a profession. So how do we have the right training, the right skills? What do we expect from people? We are failing. We can't blame anybody else because we are failing. The second thing is building trusts and contracts. So I'm a service provider. One. Red ISAC will not let my organization be immune, even though we want to contribute and participate. Right. Number two, the federal acquisition regulation is very clear in FAR Part 1 that, that a, any time we get into an acquisition situation, it's a team. So I absolutely agree. But then I talk to the security people in other organizations that are doing embarrassing things, like telling me as a service provider that I have to accept their security. We are failing as an industry because the bottom line is if you force them, your policy on me, now you change your policy, you created a constructive contract which now I can build your company. So we need to learn about contracts. Mm -hmm. So we can't start picking on lawyers and everybody. No, you're right. <laughs> because we suck at understanding contracts, contract law, relationships, and building those relationships between customers and service providers. I think Bill's got a talk on this later on. <laughs> no, I don't. Oh, no? <laughs> In the hallway near you. We have to stop coming to things like this and beating up and saying things need to get better. We need to step up to the plate and make some better. We do. We have to take responsibility. We have to turn this into a profession. So on that note, the whole point of this talk was to get the wheels turning with you. If you have interest in being part of a cross-collaboration group that would address any of these things, come and see me afterwards. I'm not telling you that there is a thing going on that you can plug into, but I am interested with people who are, are willing to innovate in this space. 
and see what we can do. So if you're interested, come and see me later and, and we can chat. And thank you for spending time with me this afternoon and enjoy the rest of the conference.